Hello. I'm ready. Are you all ready? Uh, <laughs> I say let's go ahead and get started. Um, th welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, today is Wednesday, which is when I walk through whatever random things in the uh, special collections in University Archives at Virginia Tech that I feel like walking through. So uh, let's start with just a couple of acknowledgments here. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> we'll get to those in a second. I see that there is uh, something coming in here in just a second. So um, <laughs> I'm a tad quiet today. All right. Uh, let me see what I can do about that. I'm going to step away for one second. Can you tell me, is that any better? I tried to turn up the uh, no change. OK. Um, Alice, if you're around, can you tell me how I increase the volume? Because I thought I knew how, and apparently I don't. Well, hello! I see that we have a raid coming in from 16-Bit Eric. Thank you so much, Eric, for bringing the whimsies over. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, I've been told that my mic is a little quiet, so I'm trying to talk loud, because uh, at the moment, I'm not sure how to turn it up. Uh, working on that, but welcome in, everyone. Um, today is Wednesday, which means that I do a show called Archival Adventures here from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, <laughs> and I do see uh, uh, some lovely people popping into chat, Ralph Exiv, um, Hannah, of course, you were already here. Um, I'm, I'm a bit louder now, so that is good to know. Uh, Librarian Liz, uh, just here for coffee. Melba, thank you so much for the resubscription. Uh, Wraith, uh, thank you so much for the bits. Orangitis, Lord Portico, um, thank you all for coming in. Uh, today in our archival adventure, we are going to be looking at watercolors of fungi. Um, it is a book from the 1840s that is filled with very, very pretty pictures of fungi. <laughs> so that is what we're going to be looking at today. I just have a couple of things to go through um, just at the start of stream here. Um, so I have a couple of acknowledgments that I like to do at the beginning of stream. Um, so. Let me do that first. Clumsy Tortoise, thank you for the follow. Um, so since I am here at Virginia Tech, and this stream is part of stuff that I do as the Community Collections Archivist here, um, I do want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blackbird campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation, and at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. Uh, I pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to that legacy. Um, further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blackbird campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. 
uh, and acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. Um, so I do believe it is important to continually recognize that history as we um, move forward into the future. <laughs> Melba, <laughs> today is actually um, one of multiple graduation days for the semester. Um, so it was actually a little difficult coming in this afternoon and being able to park um, because people are moving out. Uh, so <laughs> I did manage it though. Uh, that I got taken care of. I managed to get in here. I'm, um, I'm in the, the main library. I'm not in special collections at the moment. I am up on the second floor um, in what is one of our media design studios where we've got recording booth and various audio and video recording equipment. I have a, a studio camera that is in front of me. We don't have a monitor for it yet, which is why I keep having to look down because I've got two laptops that are running the two different streams because I am streaming both to Rogan27 and to the library's Twitch channel, which is VTUL Studios. Um, and then I have my iPad here with the Twitch chat up on it uh, for when I have to look away or when I go to share a screen here in a minute, I'll lose chat on one device. And so I have the iPad up so that I can see it there. Um, it's a little bit complex. And uh, <laughs> in the future, you know, we'll improve. This setup has worked during quarantine, but uh, we've been going since January with this stream and um, there are improvements to make. I definitely want to be able to do a mobile stream sometime so I can take you all on a tour of special collections. Um, there's also a few items that are just too big for me to do here. We have a double elephant folio of the Audubon Birds of America that I definitely want to show off, but that is a piece that has its own set of furniture that it came with and that I will definitely need at least a second person to help me turn pages because the books are that big. Uh, <laughs> so um, I do want to just start off by pulling up the finding aid for Watercolors of Fungi, um, which won't take us long because there isn't much of one. Um, so let me pull that up on my screen here. And uh, for anybody who's watching who hasn't stuck around or, or popped by to watch before, um, if you have any questions as I'm going through, uh, questions about archival practice, about what we're looking at, um, I, I pop them in the chat. I'm happy to try and answer. I don't know that I will necessarily know the answer, uh, but I can talk about what I know. I also have, um, usually I've got at least one other archivist from Special Collections who is modding in the chat, and so sometimes they will know the answer when I don't. Uh, so definitely um, let me know if there are questions. I'm going to switch over to the screen share so you all can see Virginia Heritage, this is the site where our finding aids are stored, and I am going to go ahead and pull up the finding aid for watercolors of fungi. Uh, and we'll see what it tells us about this. to just go ahead and remove the very end of this URL, otherwise it highlights the search term. Um, and I like to show off the clean one on stream at least. Um, a guide to the watercolors of fungi, 18.4 question uh, mark, which is an indication that this is from the 1840s, but we don't know what year. And really, this is the entire finding aid for the item that we're looking at today. It says processed by special collections. I know uh, from the collection number that it was processed sometime in 1993. Um, I don't know when we got it. I could look for the uh, accession record to find that out, but I have not done so. Um, you'll see here the 
physical, it notes 0.1 cubic feet, uh, which is just our notation um, for the size of a collection when it is just a single folder. In this case, it is a single book that was processed as a manu manuscript co collection instead of being added to the rare books collection, and I'm not certain as to why that was the case. Um, and you'll see here it just says, please note the current finding aid includes only minimal description of the collection. If you have questions, please contact Special Collections for more information. Um, essentially, we have not done the research. We don't know much more about this. Um, so the finding aid is extremely limited. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, it looks like the finding aid was probably done in 1993 and probably has not been done since. Um, and the only information in here about the item is illustrations of 50 fungi or algae found in England, perhaps a catalog of a collection. The illustrations are accompanied by brief descriptions and captions. And that's it. No information about who made it. We don't even know the exact year. But um, for May, I decided I wanted to highlight some items that we have that are related to gardening or related to plant life. Um, and so this is the first one. I've had it on my list probably, I think, since January because I was just doing a general search of stuff. It popped up and it sounded interesting. So um, that is why we're looking at it today. I'm going to go ahead and pull over to the document focus view. So you shouldn't see the screen anymore. Instead, you've got some sponges, sponge wedges here, um, and the book itself. Uh, I showed you earlier the book is in, was just in an acid-free folder. And it has this lovely cover. This book, actually, the spine is completely separated. Um, well, almost completely separated. So you can see here, um, this a lot of the stitching has come out. We'll actually be able to see a little bit about how books are constructed with this item. Um, So we have the boards here, the front board. It, it comes completely off. It's not attached at all. Um, it used to be attached, <laughs> but this book has deteriorated over time. And what you'll see is um, different sections here are stitched. So the actual pages, you can see um, the thread here that stitches the pages together. Um, and so there's a section of pages here that are stitched together. And then there's another section that are stitched together. And with each of those sections stacked, then they were threaded across. Uh, so there's little holes in the edges here. Um, you can kind of see, I think, here. Uh, you can see a hole right there. Um, it's very near the edge. There are little holes. And in those holes was additional threading that tied each of the sections together and stitched them together. And then you put the spine over top of that um, after all of those threads get pulled and tied. Uh, that's when the actual like spine that would have the printed title and, and everything like that on it goes on top. Well, we've lost that, and we've lost that cross stitching that pulls the different sections together. So the book has essentially fallen apart into the individual segments. Um, so a restorer would end up restitching things together, pulling it together like that. If we had the money or uh, a specific reason to do that kind of restoration on the book. But it gives a little bit of a glimpse of sort of book construction that you don't always get to see. Um. So with it the way that it is, I probably don't necessarily need 
the foam, uh, because the foam would be to protect the spine, and the spine is already non-existent. But I have the foam because it puts things at a decent angle for viewing for the camera. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see, there's a bunch of blank pages at the front. Um, there's no title page. There's no indication of author at the front of this book, um, which is likely why we don't know. Um, there's just no information in the book about who wrote it, who the artist is. Um, that information is just not present. Um, it is a lovely piece. Um, sorry, <laughs> the sections are coming apart on me. But we don't know who to give credit for, uh, for it to. Um, this is the first page where we get some actual information. Um, and we have a lovely, lovely illustration of a mushroom. Unsurprisingly, since this is <laughs> the collection we've named Watercolors of Fungi, uh, I'll zoom in. And there I go a little bit too far. Um, I'll zoom back out. <laughs> So here we have the first watercolor. Um, let me add some light to that. Brighten it up just a bit there. Um, it is very vibrantly colored. Uh, so this item was made in the 1840s, and um, the colors are just still really, really vibrant. Um, I will attempt to read what is here. The handwriting is very thin and a little bit difficult to read. Um, I'm going to slide this up a little bit and try and get the, the name of the mushroom in here. Um, it looks like Boletus. Rubiolarius? Uh, cryptogamia fungi. Um, I, I'm not bad with like Latin pronunciations. The problem that I'm having is the handwriting itself, um, which we've encountered before on the show where um, sometimes handwriting is just really difficult to make out. In this case, it's just very faint, like barely any ink on the quill pen or on the, the, uh, the fountain pen. And so the, the lines are really thin, and that sometimes makes it really hard to make out. So if someone went through the book and created a table of contents or index, um, Philip, if somebody did the research and provided us with a table of contents for the book, um, we would likely keep a printed copy in the folder with the book and put it in the finding aid. Because that would add information and add uh, useful context for researchers, but it wouldn't be original. So yeah, absolutely, it wouldn't we wouldn't write it into the book in a permanent fashion, but yeah, we would include it in the folder. Um, so the description here for the art um, you can see the description, but I'm going to show you the art while I read the description. It says, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try and read the description. Wow. Um, it's the Belitis 
Ru Rubiolarius, which is the best I can make out of the name, not very rare, has been found in England and in Staffordshire, Staffordshire. Um, the fine crimson cinnabar on or sorry, the fine crimson cinnabar or vermilion colored It's a little too far away. One second. I'm going to try and pull the camera closer so that I can get a better view of the handwriting while you all can still look at the picture. <laughs> um, the fine crimson cinnabar or vermilion colored uh, poor. Sorry, I'm getting in the in the way of the camera. I don't want to do that. Um, Porston? I'm not sure that word. Or seed is often so copious by shed as to stain everything that touches it and is so thick under the under the pores as almost to obscure them. 250 English fungi. So what's funny, in this case, the issue with trying to read the handwriting is not even the handwriting itself. The handwriting is not difficult to make out. The lines themselves are so faint that it's hard to read. I'm going to move to the next one because I want to show off as many of these 250 fungi as possible. So here um, we have a blank page between each and that's because these are watercolors that were painted directly onto the page. Um, And I've seen this in a couple of other books, and I'm not 100% certain as to the reasoning. I'm guessing it's because there can be bleed through from the paint um, onto the back of the page, and they want a clean page for writing the description. Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit further so you can see the full illustration there. Um, Fucus, fucus nodosus knobbed ficus, cryptogamia algae, fucus, and I think it's F-U-C-U-S. Uh, fucus. Nodosus, a very common fungus upon all our coasts, generally washed up by the tide plentifully in the, in the mouth of great rivers. It bears its fructification in December. This species can be compounded with no other confounded with no other the red bladder which cracks with a sharp report when 
trod down upon and the per peculiar situation of the fructification both clearly distinguish it. 570, English botany. Um, it's, it's very definitely the word that they wrote is confounded. Um, I don't know why I read it as compounded originally, but they, they definitely said it can be confounded with no other. Um, they do mean confused, but the, like, if I was translating it to modern um, U.S. English, it would be confused that we would use, uh, but the term that they wrote in here is confounded. All right, and I'm uncertain why that the stream buffered for a minute there. Also, I just noticed I didn't have the captions on. <laughs> I apologize for that. Hopefully, uh, they should be working now. Um, I had tested them and was all set, and they were ready to go, and I forgot to turn them on. Um, here we have, uh, Steris Aquilina, Common Breaks, Cryptogamia Gillises. The most common of European f forms growing copiously on Heath and in woods in all parts of our island. A hmm, I'm not sure of this word. A It starts with a TR. A something section of the stem shows the pith of a branched figure compared by some to a spread eagle, by others to King Charles in the oak, but rustic. But rustic lovers fancy them, uh, fancy they here see the in initials of their future spouse, of which there is no doubt, for the figure in question can, hmm. I'm not sure what this word is, but I think we'll get it the sentence anyway. For the figure in question, something, anything of the uh, pleasure of the imagination. The principal use of this plant, besides, is for is for giving I'm not sure. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit and you all can look at the handwriting yourself if you want. Uh, but I'm, I'm struggling to make out a couple of the words here. Woo, that's a little too far. I shouldn't hold down the button. 
it's slow to respond. Um, but I should not hold down the button. Okay. Uh, autofocus. So we have the principal use of the plant. besides is for is for something <laughs> it's for giving hi Laura <laughs> welcome in uh, giving neg it looks like neglectus renda Like, it, it looks like after this sentence that it switches over to Latin for some reason, and I'm uncertain what it's saying. Um, and then it says 1679 England or English botany. So I'm uncertain what the uh, principal use for the plant is. Uh, it would take a little bit of study, possibly photocopying it and darkening the lines so that I could make out the letters a little bit better. Um, there are a couple of different options for how to clear it up so that it could be read. Uh, having a second pair of eyes look at it and see if they can just immediately recognize the word, which sometimes happens. Um, but I'm not going to spend all day trying to figure out what what they wrote about this plant. I'm curious as to the numbering system that they have in here for the illustrations. So we've ha we had 250 English fungi, we had 570 English botany, now we have 1679 English botany, um, and I don't know what all of that is referring to at this point. Oh, that's the end of that segment. <laughs> Next. So this one is very brown. I'll see if I can zoom in on the, fo on the I was going to call it a photograph. It is a very, very nice watercolor. Like, there's information in here, not just of a botanical nature, but the illustrations are just gorgeous. See how far I can zoom in and get you a good picture here. Because there's detail that is not showing up on this camera yet. Oh, sorry, trying to center the picture. It doesn't help that there's delay between what I'm doing and what shows up on stream. Okay. Here we have Piziza atrorufa, black and red Piziza, cryptogamia fungi. Piziza atrorufa. Uh, hab on decayed branches of trees being on the ground in autumn. Such a 
he would. Oh, I don't know this. There's a proper name for the name of a wood, and then it says to Bambridge. So it's giving a range for where this fungus can be found. Um, I can't make out the proper name of what this wood is called. It looks like it starts with an A um, or an S. Uh, and then it says, this singular species of Paziza is remarkable for having the root composed of a uh, beard-like a beard-like mat of filaments, which the remainder of the other surface, which, yeah, remainder of the outer surfaces is glabrous, G-L-A-B-R-O-U-S, glabrous. It is a word that I have heard, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> 315, Scottish cryptogamic flora. see what's next. Ooh, this one's going to require me to zoom back out again. <laughs> Look at that, it, the pink and yellow and just like charcoal from the pencil itself. Orangitis, I will be happy for a definition of glabrous if you want to uh, provide it. Uh, Exclaria fulgens. Splendid Exclaria. Um, skip, hmm, tryptogamia algae, glabrous, adjective, having a surface devoid of hair or pubescence. So the roots of, the roots of this fungus are a mat of fibers and the rest of it is hairless is smooth. It's a very descriptive term, one that I did not know. Thank you, Orangitis. <laughs> um, Exclaria fulgens have on various small algae in the sea in spring and Again, it's giving a range. Um, and I can't make out the first part of it. Ap apen Basically, from somewhere to Carmichael, because I can read Carmichael. This beautiful plant is conspicuous for its shining, glistening appearance, resembling minute portions of open glass. 291, Scottish Cryptogamia flora. Figure 1, Exulgen's natural size. Figure 2, a group of plants magnified. 
So up at the top is the natural size, and down here is it magnified. The handwriting is just so faint that A P P I N It looks like A P P I N C A P T but I don't I'm not confident in in that Carmichael I can read <laughs> So the range of where you'll find that I'm not certain it would take a little bit more time to decipher that um and I'm sure with the name, you can probably look up the, the fungus online and get much more information about it than what's in this book. Um, but these are very detailed notes. And just look at the illustration here, the time it would take to study the plant and then recreate that using watercolor. Um, it's just, it's gorgeous. Equisetum silcaticum. Possibly. It looks like S Y L C A T I C U M. High growing toward the sun. Um, yeah, the illustrations. Whoever made this book had real talent in, in drawing these fungi. Uh, branched wood horsetail, cryptogamia filices. This very elegant species occurs in moist, shady places, often under dripping rocks, um, chiefly in the mountainous counties. Uh, something early in the spring. The whole plant conveys the idea of some Indian palm tree with its simple stem and I can't make out that word. Shorts of compound drooping slender branches crossed at the summit by a cone not not certain how that ends but it's a, it's a physical description of the the fungus that he's giving there or that they're giving there uh, 1874 English botany Next we have, woo, that's pretty. I like that one. I'm going to take a sip of water and zoom in on this, on this uh, mushroom here. It is a very recognizable. I feel like we've seen it in many storybooks. Um, and yet, I cannot make out the name of it. A G A 
R I C U S Agaricus M U S C A R I E C Muscari Mus Agaricus muscarius possibly this plant consists of more parts than any other agaric we know of having a having a this is the word that is present here um, V U L V A having a vulva annulus and stipes stipes it does it is an i um <laughs> Oh, Amanita muscaria. Thank you, Hannah. It, the, this definitely is listed as uh, Agaricus muscari muscarius. So, slightly different name, but probably very similar. Um, again, this is this terminology is from 1840, so it's entirely possible the name has been altered or changed, or that this is just slightly different, um, where the Amanita muscaria may be like an American version of this fungus, where this is the English version. Um, uh, agaric Let's see. Linnaeus says that this is a most prosperous, pronounced, uncertain, agaric, and that a decoction of it in milk will destroy something. P-H-I-S? Something. I'm not sure. Whence its name? He also recommends it as I don't know. Apparently, it has some potential medicinal uses, according to Linnaeus. Uh, <laughs> uh, when prepared in a decoction of milk, um, it is found of fond of various. C O N. Mm, hard to make out that word too, uh, but I believe what they're saying here is that it can be found in various areas. Um, number two eight six English fungi. And according to Hannah in chat, apparently it is poisonous, but when prepared properly, it's eaten in parts of Europe and Asia. Yes, yes, absolutely, Hannah um, Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy. <coughs> At least that is what the name looks to be in the book here. So, and I am going to show you this one, and I need to just step away for one second because I scratched myself, and I need to uh, deal with that. I will be right back.
I didn't have any Band-Aids, but I did have scotch tape and paper towels. So <laughs> that'll be enough to get me through the end of the stream. Uh, and by then, it'll probably have scabbed over. But I scratched my arm and didn't want to uh, mess up the materials. <laughs> All right, uh, here we have an item that is Berkeleya fragilis, fragile Berkeleya, cryptogamia algae. Let's see. They all, a lot of the entries start out HAB. Um, which I'm taking to be a, an abbreviation of habitat. Um, so uh, this says parasitic on small algae spring. This highly corrosive algae Uh, forms the Wow. I am struggling a lot to make out this entry. Uh, forms the type of a new genus of which the generic name is a tribute to the talents of the something M. J. Berkeley who has paid much attention to this beautiful type of plants, 294 Scottish cryptogamic flora. <laughs> oh, the Agaricus muscarius name was apparently used by Carl Linnaeus in one of his books from 1753. Hannah, that is very, very helpful information. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Also, letting me know that I apparently am not doing too poorly at trying to make out this handwriting because Agaricus muscarius is what I got from the handwriting here. <laughs> so you're making me feel better about my ability with deciphering this, uh, this handwriting. Ooh! This art is so intricate. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on this one because it is absolutely gorgeous. Just the precision that had to be used to get this using watercolor. It's so delicate. Like it, looking at it, I could see doing this with like a colored pencil, but this is watercolor and it is amazing. Uh, let's see. Silacnum vasculosum var acritife. Bugais fruited silacrum. Cryptogamia musci. Let's see. Silacnum 
vaculosum var acutifolia. <clears throat> the The present remarkable variety in or is distinguished by the much shorter stems almost black color and above all by the acute termination of the leaves. It occurs on Ben Lorne. Lor I'm uncertain. It's a, it's a place name and I would have to research place names in England to be sure that I got it right. Um, and other night owning mountains in bare wet spots and do Uh, I'm not, I'm not certain on this sentence and does not form the fine tufted I don't know uh, which render the common state of the species so commonplace. 311 Scottish cryptogamic flora. The art is beautiful. The I'm guessing I'm guessing that the numbers and names are I'm I think that the notes in here are entries that he's copied out of other works. So I'm guessing that there is a work called Scottish cryptogamic flora that he has copied the notes, like the botanical notes, about this specimen from. And that it is the 311th item in a work called Scottish Cryptogamic Flora. Um, and then he's done the illustration. <coughs> that, that's my best guess as to what the numbers and <coughs> names are that follow at the end of the entries, uh, that these are not original entries and he's noting where the description comes from for the illustration that he's done. And I keep saying he because this is 1840 and it's highly unlikely that this was not a um, man doing the illustrations, but while highly unlikely I should probably switch to saying they um, because we don't know and there is it, it is entirely possible that it was not a man uh, that was doing this art and this scientific um, essentially catalog uh, of fungus from England. Uh, let's see. Acnanthes Brevip Hmm. Brevip Brevipres? Brevipes? Something. I'm, I'm uncertain. 
on this Latin name. Uh, Acanthes comes out. The second word is B R E V I P E S. Um, not certain how to pronounce it. Not 100% certain on that spelling either. Uh, hab on small algae in the sea. This little algae is whimsical in its appearance, was discovered for the first time on the British wash by Captain Carmichael. 295 Scottish cryptogamic flora. Figure one uh, is the natural size, and figure two is magnified. These are really beautiful illustrations. Um, I will continue to be amazed by them. Ooh. Nemospora magna. Large Nemospora cryptogamia fungi. Oh, you can't see it. I need to scoot it up. <laughs> there we go. Nemospora. <laughs> uh, hab on the dead barks of various trees throughout the year. This is the largest specimen, specimen of Nemospora we are acquainted with, and though not of frequent occurrence, is founded occasionally in astonishing abundance on Hambian? That proper name continues, but I'm uh, not certain what it says. Uh, number 349, Scottish cryptogamic flora. Ooh. How is that watercolor? It's so delicate. <laughs> Just wow, look at that. Fucus asper egoides. Asparagoides. S A S P A R A G O I D E S. <laughs> Asparagus ficus. Cryptogamic. Cryptogamia algae. Fucus, not ficus, F U C U S. Um, found on the beach at Yarmouth from Jime, J I M E, to. Oh, nope. <laughs> Found at the beach, found on the beach at Yarmouth from June to November, though seldom in abundance, bearing its bearing its fronds chiefly in August and September. The name. The name not unaptly
the name not unaptly complements the general form of the plant, which in some measure, though not precisely, recalls the idea of a miniature garden asparagus in form. In front? I don't know. The last word I'm unclear on, but it, that's the general sense of what's written here. 571 English Botany. I know! Like, growing toward the sun, I don't know how you get lines that thin with watercolor. Like, had to be using a single hairbrush. <laughs> It does, I, so I'm unfamiliar with asparagus except for like what you get at the store. So Hannah, this does actually look a lot like asparagus. It's just so tiny and delicate. Like it looks like a tiny little illustration of an orange tree, but it's, it's actually an illustration of some algae. But just, the detail and just gentle depiction with watercolor, like this makes more sense as watercolor to me, but those like delicate little lines are just amazing. Scooch this up a little. Uh, Scott's Prendrium vulgare, common heart's tongue, cryptogamia, gillises, common on most shady rocks, deserted vines, the inside of walls, and other damp hollow places. The fructification is most perfect for examination in July. The fronds are sometimes accidentally cloven or even branched at the summit. 1150 English Botany. I just, I, I find this piece, this entire book, to be just a little hidden gem in our collection. Um, it's there. It's very minimally described. And if somebody's interested in fungi and, uh, or watercolors of, of botanicals or things like that, it's there for somebody to find. So it's, it's not like it's hidden. Um, but I think it's a hidden gem because, oh wow, I just noticed that an hour ago Antikythera Mech 73 followed and I didn't say thank you for the follow. Uh, so I'm saying that now. Uh, if you're still here Antikythera Mech 73, thank you for following. Um, I, I just think this is an item that doesn't probably doesn't get used very much, and it has really gorgeous art in it. Um, so I'm excited to be showing it off. Um, <coughs> Exilaria. Wow, that's a combination of letters. F-L-A-B-E-L-L-A-T-A. -E Flabaletta. Flabellata. Exilaria flabellata. Uh, fan shaped exilaria. Cryptogamia algae. Hab. On. Uh, 
on Faustuna marina and several small algae in spring. Alpen, nope, Appen, Captain Carmichael. This superb species is under 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 steadily understand I'm guessing it's understandably the glory of the genus and in every point of view a beautiful object 298 Scottish cryptogamic flora figure 1 is on Fostera marina, and figure two is the plants magnified. I think this may be the one that I actually used for the promotional image for today. I don't remember which illustration I used, uh, but this one definitely caught my eye. Next we have, ooh, so as far as art is concerned, I think this is actually one of the better pieces we've seen, um, mainly because it, it could just, e it could easily look like just a couple of blobs of the same colors. There's, it's white on the outside, it's orange on the inside. There's not a lot of like texture. There's not like ribbing that you get on the underside of mushrooms. So it's just like a uniform orange color, but there's shading to it. There's dimension and depth. There's the, the actual art. Um, if you look, yeah, okay, yeah, so the, the last one was the one that I used in the promotional tweet. Um, so the white exterior here, it's just faintly yellow at the top and starts as a more pure white and shades down darker and darker and darker as it gets into a more shaded area. And then the same thing with the orange for the top. Um, you've got little blemishes where it's darker in one spot or another and it f gets slightly darker as it approaches the edge. Like there's dimension and depth that is put in there with the watercolor technique um, that would be easy to miss. It would be easy to just do oh, an orange blob with white and a little like outline. Um, but instead we have this glorious, glorious uh, watercolor painting of this fungus. Um, Paziza uh, Paziza cochinea, cryptogamia fungi. Uh, I have many dried specimens of this plant and cannot agree with Dr. Wittenning that this is the same species with P. Epiden epidendra. That's the only note. Uh, 78. Um, Subi's English fungi. It's definitely not Subi's, but it's something like S-O, yeah, 
I, I can't make out the, n the name that he puts after the 78, which I, again, think is a reference to a specific book that he's getting notes from. Uh, it's interesting that he, that the, that they note here that they have many, many dried specimens of it and they don't agree that it's the same as a different fungus that apparently uh, Dr. Vithenning um, wanted to, or proposed that this and another should be combined and not d differentiated anymore. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous illustration though. I really, really love these illustrations. <laughs> we have quite a bit more book. There's no way we get through the entire thing before the end of the stream. Oh my goodness. It's glorious. <laughs> and the name makes sense. Uh, Fucus sanguinicus. Um, just from <laughs> my knowledge of Latin, sanguinicus makes sense. Uh, sanguine or uh, th they, that all comes from the root for blood. Um, so the pink color. Uh, red dock-leaved fungus, or fucus, cryptogamia algae. Uh, fucus sanguinicus, not very rare on submarine rocks and stones, nor is it unfrequently cast up on the sea beach in various parts of England and Scotland. The brilliant rose colors of the fucus and its delicately waved and veined leaves render it a beautiful and Generally attractive object, 1041 English botany. <laughs> you all get to see the top of my head a lot as I get as close as possible to the page to actually be able to make out this writing. Uh, but at least you have a lovely watercolor to look at while you're staring at the top of my head. <laughs> Oh, wow. Here again, we have the little and the, the big. They're just so good. This person is such a good artist. I wish we knew who it was. Um, Flacaria glonca hab on the surface of a solution of gum arabic, a curious and elegant little plant, but not referable to any known genus, 301 Scottish cryptogamic flora, figure 1, uh, F. Glonka, natural size, figure two, a group of plants magnified. So the, the hab, habitat note, <laughs> just on the surface of a solution of gum arabic. So I take that to mean where it was found, or where this researcher located it. Um, ooh, another delicate little branching structure. This time in more of like a crimson red or like a fire truck red. Um, just still amazing that this work was done with uh, watercolor. Uh, fucus savalosus, stone crop fucus, uh, 
cryptogamia algae for a knowledge for a knowledge of this fucus we are obliged to w tremens uncertain um, who found it on the back uh, on the beach in norfolk Uh, learning, leaving its finish in July and August, and undoubtedly of annual duration. Sir F. Franklin has often observed it in at Scarborough, 1203 English Botany. Next up, a very lovely illustration here. I'll zoom out so you can see the root structure as well. Just absolutely gorgeous. Um, Ophioglossum. Vilgatum, Ophioglossum vilgatum, adder's tongue, Cryptogamia gillica, gillis, gillis, gillises. I'm, I'm uncertain. Again, I am making out uh, Latin taxonomical names in 1840s handwriting at the moment. Um, it's done with a very fine stroke. So you, the delicate touch that you see in the artwork also comes through in the handwriting, which sometimes makes the words very difficult to make out because they're very faint on the page. Um, so while it's great for the art, not so great for the handwriting. Um, this singular vegetable is by no means uncommon in boggy meadows. Flowering in hay or flowering in May or June, an infusion of its leaves in olive oil is famous for curing wounds and is of so beautiful a green that many have supposed it made uh, that many have supposed it made of verdigris. 108 English botany. So apparently, according to English folklore at least, an infusion of this in olive oil will, will cure wounds. It's interesting that in the description they call this a vegetable. Um, they're, they've done references to things as fungi and algae and this is the first time we've seen something referred to as a vegetable. Ooh, some bright red fungus here. It appears to be growing on tree branches. Uh, we've ha got a Paziza. Epidendra, cryptogamia fungi. This beautiful fungus was found at uh, Camberwell among decaying sticks, sometimes protruding from one more than on such more than on such deep in the bark. The outside is very woolly, attaching it to 
straws and other soil Uh, no, attaching it to straws and other substances in its way in in huh in drying it becomes leathery and less vivid in colors. 13 English fungi. <laughs> it, it gets a little bit um, stressful <laughs> trying to read this old handwriting on stream. Uh, I'm very thankful for everybody who's sticking around enjoying the pictures while I struggle to make out uh, handwriting from the 1840s for you. <laughs> I, I don't mind reading things to you all. Um, reading things to you all while at the same time trying to make out somebody else's handwriting from a couple of hundred years ago. Oh boy, that's hard. <laughs> but I enjoy it nonetheless. I'm going to try and wait down the pages a little bit so that I can leave this art up for you while I take a, another sip of water. Yeah, the art is amazing, Geek Outs. Absolutely gorgeous. Like, the, the intricacy and delicacy of watercolor to do that, amazing. I really, really wish that we knew who the artist was. <coughs> Uh, Fucus Bassiferans? Bassiferus. Berry bearing Fucus. Cryptogamia algae. Uh, Communicated by W. Turner, who first distinguished its form. Uh, F. Natanz, with which Linnaeus and other botanists had confounded it. Both were... Both are something by abandoned floating on the ocean in various parts of the globe. So noting like where you can find it, um, even though I can't make out all the words. And uh, Thence washed occasionally upon our shore, both the Fuki above mentioned are comprehended by voyagers under the appellation of Gulf part seed or Gulf part weed, something like that. I'm not 100% certain what that word is. Um, number 1967, English botany. So this, this looks similar to something that I have seen before at the seaside. But look at that art. Look at the... The, so the leaves on here, they have little like points. And each one, um, like there's, there's a pencil sketch underneath and then it's filled in with watercolor, but it is so precise. And the little dots for the little balls that are on it, it's just amazing. <gasps> I'm just... 
thoroughly um, astounded and amazed by this art. We are about halfway through the book. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this book is falling apart. <laughs> the spine is not really there anymore. The, the spinal joining, um, the stitching that held the different leaves together is not there. So we've got the individual stitched sections um, with just the tack stitching, and then they're not actually bound together as a book anymore. Um, but it is still usable. How? How do you do this, this delicacy of art in watercolor? Granted, I am not a very practiced watercolorist, but just wow, it's amazing to me. Uh, who? Hyphnium. Breviostra. Hab. Woods. It has been found in... Appleshire? I'm uncertain whether that's a place, but that's what the word looks like to me. By Captain Carmichael, uh, New Forest, Devonshire, Manchester by W. Hobson. The leaves are curiously contracted at the base of the accumulation by a single undulation on each side. 337 Scottish Cryptogamic Flora. Yeah, that's the thing, Geek Outs. Like, it act, the, the watercolor itself is very precise. So if I zoom in closer, you can actually see the individual strokes that were done to, to do this leaf work. So they're very precise. They're very individual. And it comes out looking fuzzy, which is, I'm guessing, what the actual plant looks like. That is very precision artwork. And it's just amazing. Now I have to zoom back out so that you can actually see this entire piece of art. go. Uh, Lycia fragiformis. Red Lycia cryptogamia fungi. Hab. On rotten wood, dead leaves. Uh, Mopes graphius. I'm uncertain what that word is meant to be. Um, in summer and autumn, after rainy weather, not unfrequent. This is a remarkably pretty fungus and bears a considerable re resemblance to a strawberry. 308 Scottish cryptogramic... Er, Cryptogamic flora. I would say it bears more of a resemblance to a raspberry based on the illustration, but the notes say to a strawberry. Uh, 
<coughs> Fucus norwegicus. Red Norway fungus, or red Norway fucus, F U C U S, uh, cryptogamia algae. Specimens, oh, it's too high. I have to scooch it down so you can see it better. Now it's too low. <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. Stream delay. Everything I can see is actually just a couple seconds late on the computer, so uh, trying to get it centered in the window for you. There we go. Specimens of this fungus, of this fucus, were communicated to us by W. Turner, who received it from W. Guillory, its original discoverer at Dover. 1080 English botany. That doesn't give you a lot of information about it. And we just have this illustration. It does look like coral. I have no idea how big this fungus is, um, where it can be found. It's called Red Norway Fucus. So. It's a lovely illustration of it. Oh, wow, look at this one. Let me zoom out so you can see the entire thing. Uh. Gaas gastrum multifid multifidum gastrum multifidum hab woods and ridge banks oh sorry this is the many cleft earth star cryptogamia fungi uh, lives on woods and ridge banks near Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh, in 1788, Sir J. E. Smith Woodmill Plantation, Fifeshire, James Herrett. Interesting. Uh, just that's a lot of attribution for this single plant. It looks like something someone has made into jewelry. Yeah, it's it's really pretty. Um, plant produced between beneath the surface of the soil of a globular form when. When uh, wounded at maturity, the outer the outer something. It's a word that starts with P. Uh, bunch at the summit splits into several unequal segments which expand, throw off the soil, and expose the inner foundation to the atmosphere. 306 Scottish cryptogamic flora. I just, it's very pretty. <laughs> and just the illustration of it is so well done. 
Apparently, it grows underground, and if you, if it gets wounded, it pulls back and punches up through the soil. That's what the description says. Okay, this one. This one to me looks like just blobs of paint on paper. It's the first time we've seen that, though. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to have a lot of definition or depth to the illustration. Fucus edulis. Red leathery fungus, or dulce, or fucus, or dulce. Cryptogamia algae. Uh, H. Fromer has received this from Dover, Cornwall, and North Wales. We have collected it on the South Shore, but it is not less frequent there than the Hmm, then the palin palantive. Which last we can confidently assert to the to be the species most commonly uh, eaten now at Edinburgh. However, Profitable, preferable, sorry, however preferable that was before we may be for culinary purposes on account of its more fleshy texture and abundant something. <laughs> when mentioned, after having been dried, it exhales a violet scent. 1307 English Botany. Yeah, uh, I'm not... Given the detail and delicacy of the artwork in this book, it makes me think that this fungus in real life just looks like this. <laughs> and um, the name of it, it's Red Leathery Fucus. So I'm inclined to trust the artist that they did their same standard of work here. Um, and that this is just what the fungus looks like. <laughs> also, apparently something that's eaten in Edinburgh. Because then we follow that up with this, this amazing delicacy of artwork. I love that I'm at least uh, Conveying things well enough that you're able to Google them. <laughs> um, Adiantum capillus veneris, true maidenhair, cryptogamia felicis. This most rare and elegant form was gathered in the South Islands of. Aaron, near Galloway, by W. J. T. Hackney. Nothing can be more beautiful than this Adentum when growing amongst trickling rills in the crevices, crevices of shady rocks, which it overhangs in the most graceful manner. 1564 English Botany.
Yeah, I can see parsley. Ooh, this one's bright yellow. Acthalium glavum. Flav nope. It's flavum. Acthalium flavum. Common acthalium. On tan, both in the open and in the and in the something pits, also on masses of dead leaves, on trunks of decaying trunks of decaying trees, and sometimes even on living herbs. Acthalium, or autumn, sorry. Plant exceedingly variable, soft and soft and something in the young state and afterwards changes to one remarkable for dry seeds. Not seeds. I don't know what that word is. It is a great nuisance to gardeners. <laughs> 272 Scottish cryptogamic flora. Apparently a great nuisance to gardeners. <laughs> we do have more illustrations of fungus um, we have uh, an item called the Mushroom Book, which is too big for me to show on here. I will show it sometime, though, once I'm able to get a mobile setup. It's just too big. Um, uh, we have a couple of different uh, fungus-related things. So um, I'm just going to flip through a few more illustrations. Yeah, I want to show that Mushroom Book. Um, It's just, it's large. It's not as big as the double elephant folio of the Audubon Birds of America. Um, but it is a, it, it's about three times the size of this book. So it's too big for this document camera. And once we're able to move, when we move into the fall and we get back to more normal operations for the library, um, I can look at what technology we have available, possibly just setting up another studio camera that's facing down at the table um, to use for larger items like that. Um, it's just right now the setup that we have really doesn't work for anything bigger than an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. <laughs> um, growing toward the sun, most of our rare books are not uh, digitally archived. Um, we would love to scan and make available everything that we have. Um, but for the most part, unless there's a specific request from a researcher or a grant to get it done, um, we just don't have the staffing. It takes a lot of time and money um, in order to fully digitize these items and make them available online. Because it's not just taking a picture of it and throwing it online. Um, it's, we have to do, a, a, we have to get a scan that is to a certain quality. And then we have to create metadata for each page and then combine those into a single document that can be put online and that will flip through in the proper order. So in digitizing a book, there are a lot of steps um, involving describing the item, getting good quality images, making sure it functions online on a modern platform, um, and providing descriptive data so that people can find it. Um, so there's, just, there's a lot of work that goes into it. 
So most of these items are not available online in digital form. Um, and this one, like I would happily refer you to some places that might have things like this if we knew who made it. But we don't. So all we are able to say is, hey, we have this great book that's got these lovely illustrations of English fungus uh, from sometime in the 1840s. And I'm not even sure how they know that it's from the 1840s. Uh, because I haven't seen anything in the item itself that tells me that that's the, the date that it's from. So, Philip, yes, if the book was being digitized, there would be a scan of the front cover, a scan of the inside cover, and every individual blank page would also get scanned. It wouldn't have as much metadata. It would mostly just be the linking metadata that lets you know that this is page three and it's followed by page four, etc. But in digitizing a book like this, we would digitize every single page, including all of the blank pages. We don't tend to do a lot of book digitization like that. Um, there are other places that do. Um, I know like the Special Collections and University Archives at the University of Iowa um, is set up to do book digitization um, and generally always has a project going that is doing some of that. Uh, but they also have a program there that's called like the Center for the Book. Um, they study book production. They have uh, classes that go into the actual like physical manufacture of codices, uh, which is the type of book that has multiple pages with a spine that that's, it's called a codex. Um, and, and so they actual, actually have an academic program there that is focused on the study of the physical form and production of codices. Uh, so it makes a lot more sense for them. Um, our program here is much smaller. Uh, and we're more focused on specific subject areas. Um, this book itself, this is not really one of the subject areas that we focus on. So it, it's not like a high candidate for us to digitize because it's not one that people are going to seek us out to find. Um, so we are nearing the end of the stream. I'm just flipping pages here while I talk to you all. Um, because I want to show off as much of the art as I can, because it's so pretty. Um, but we will be looking to do a raid here very shortly. I'm guessing if they're live, I will do the Monterey Bay Aquarium, because they are always a lovely um, kind of chill afternoon educational stream that I can throw things over to, and uh, I can support um, a lovely organization. It does look like they are live and that they are doing uh, sea otters this afternoon. So we will go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium very shortly. Um, next week on Archival Adventures, I am going to pull from our rare books collection and we are going to look at seed catalogs. Um, we have a number of seed catalogs from the past. Uh, some of them are quite fragile. I don't know if I will pull those because uh, I can get ones that are less fragile and we'll still get a good sense. But um, uh, I, we also have a finding aid, or not a finding aid, we have a, um, a lib guide that provides information on like the history of seed catalogs or a little bit of information about that. Um, Kira, who is mod for both channels, um, knows a lot more about seed catalogs than I do, so hopefully she'll be able to make it. But if not, we will explore them together, and uh, that should be a fun time. And then I think two weeks from now, we will probably look at the, um, the Master Gardener program, which is a program through Virginia Tech's Cooperative Extension, I believe, um, that happens once a summer here. Um, and I think... I think that will put us through to the end of May. Um, I haven't decided yet what we're doing for June. If anybody has um, things that you might like to see that are from 
our collecting areas, do let me know, and I'm happy to pull, s pull stuff out. At some point in time, I want to do some ornithology stuff because I happen to like birds, and we have um, some ornithology material here. Um, so that's some stuff to look forward to. Next week, we'll do seed catalogs. Uh, anybody who's, ooh, look. BHL, headquartered at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, operates a worldwide consortium of natural history, botanical research, and national libraries working together to address this challenge by digitizing the natural history literature. Yeah, and, and I think if we, if we had extensive collections of that here, Growing Toward the Sun, um, I think we would definitely be interested in taking part in something like that. Um, like I said, it's not one of the main focuses, uh, focuses of the collections that we have here. So we have a few small items like this, um, and they haven't really been a priority for our digitization efforts, but, um, but we do have some nice items, and <coughs> we're always, we're always working to make more of our materials as, as accessible as we possibly can. Um, so I'm, if you're affiliated with that program at the Smithsonian and want to get in touch with me, you're welcome to do so. Um, you can reach out to Special Collections. Um, our email for contact purposes would be specref at vt.edu. Um, that is our, our main email address to ask questions of Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Uh, so that's specref at vt.edu. Um, so if, if you have questions about our archives, um, or like I said, if you happen to be affiliated with that Smithsonian program and want to get in touch with us about our botanical materials, um, you can reach out that way. Um, for anybody who watches on the Rogan 27 channel, I should be live again on Friday afternoon uh, for a video game stream around 2 p.m. Uh, so look back then. Um, you can find all that information on my schedule below. Um, we'll look to do seed catalogs next week. And um, yeah, I'm going to set up the raids and we'll head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for some sea otter fun. Uh, thank you everybody for stopping by today. I had a good time looking at all of these wonderful watercolors. Um, I think this book is amazing and I wish that we knew a lot more about it. Uh, I will see you all next time and please stick around for the raid. Say hello to everybody over at Monterey Bay. Um, let's see, I have to type. And yeah, like I said, thank you everybody for stopping by. Um, that is going to be the end of things for today. I will see you next week.